I rushed through specialty flares a little bit um, on Tuesday. We were running out of time. I'm going to go over that a little bit more in detail today, um, as well as spend a little bit of time on mechanical components, um, but really want to spend quite a bit of time going into beneficial use, how that's integrated within the flare system and the gas plants, and then also go over some drawing review <clears throat> to really try to teach you guys how to read PNIDs. It's a really great skill um, when you're applying for internships or jobs that you can read PNIDs, you're familiar with them. So we'll go over a little bit of the control logic as well. So mentioned on Tuesday, there's three types of specialty flares that we use for the biogas industry. Um, there is the low emissions flare. Like many of the other John Zink products, we have low emission burners, ultra low noxic burners. Uh, we have a low emissions flare for this particular industry. I'm going to hold off on talking about the uh, siloxane system flare until we get to the gas plant because that's where that one comes into play. And then we'll talk about the hybrid thermal oxidizer as well. So the first one is the ultra low admissions biogas flare. And so what you're looking at is looks like a regular enclosed flare that we talked about Tuesday. Um, you're going to see the blower skid, the piping. We haven't got into the blower skid yet. But essentially, that's the same for a regular flare system. What's different with the ultra-low emissions flare is the ducting that you see along with the large air blower over to the left. So we developed this technology. We were the first of its kind. We developed it in 1996 at our R&D facility. We put the first one in operation in 98. It has three US patents. Uh, one of them is process, and two of them are mechanical. And really, we went through a series of testing to figure out what is the best way in this application and this gas composition to lower NOx. And there's a variety of ways of how you lower NOx. I'm sure Professor Bach will talk to you about that. <clears throat> and so we needed to really figure out what was the best fit for our industry. So the US EPA is constantly trying to reduce emissions. On the US level, the NOx was at 0.06 pounds per million BTU. There were other states, particularly California, um, that wanted to reduce the overall footprint. So local state regulations were reaching out to us wanting to know if there's anything more that we could do. So for the ultra low emissions, 0.06 NOx is what it is for our standard flare. 0.025 is what we were able to achieve for our low emissions. CO was 0.2 for regular, it's 0.06 for this particular flare. We have a higher destruction efficiency. It doesn't have the turn down that a regular enclosed flare would. A regular enclosed flare is about 10 to 1. Remember, turn down is the ratio between the maximum flow rate to the minimum flow rate. And because it is premix, we talked a little bit about that on, Thursday, on Tuesday, you're going to have uh, a cooler flame. That's how we're lowering the NOx which means we're going to have a lower operating temperature. So as opposed to a normal operating temperature about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, you may be able to operate this one at 1400, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really important when you start doing permits. As you work with different agencies and they're writing in the permit, they write in a minimum operating temperature. So when you're dealing with low emission technology, you want to make sure that that gets changed. Do you have a question? Who writes the patents for these? Is it like an engineer and a law team? Or both exactly so it's it, it's really whatever engineer within john zing for example um, wants to champion the technology there may be more than one person that writes the patent uh, and then we have a legal team that reviews that makes you know make sure that there's not an existing patent that we might be infringing upon uh, and then they'll go ahead and file all the paperwork so we have a separate team first we'll see if it's patentable if there's anything else that exists um, and then you start that process pattern. Good question. So NOx formation, um, you guys have probably talked about how NOx is formed, the three different types of NOx, thermal, fuel bound, and prompt. For our particular application, most of the NOx that we get is from thermal, which essentially means the more that you heat it up, the more you're gonna break off those ends and those O's, and then they're going to stick to each other and you get nitrous oxide, NO or NO2. So if you can try to reduce that amount of heat up, you're going to reduce the amount of NOx. So that's exactly easy 
as you can state it, how we were going to reduce the NOx for this particular application. So how, do we, how are we going to do it? So this is where we started to do some testing. Was it going to be dilution? Was it going to be um, staging air? So on the refinery flare applications, Chris Foster probably talked to you about this, they can do a variety of, of different staging air, staging fuel for different types of combustion. Again, for us, because we're not in a refinery you know, space, what we found was dilution is going to be the best option for this industry. So you can kind of see here a little bit of diffusion and then premix. And you can also see that there is, you have to, there's a certain amount of premix where a little bit is not enough and too much is not good either. So you got to really find out how much air and premixing you need to get the NOx reduction, but also remember to keep out of that combustion area. Okay? We do not want to have a combustible mixture prior to ignition because everything in that pipeline that's combustible is going to burn, which means you're going to blow up a whole landfill that's acres and acres and acres. It's catastrophic. For CO, typically what you see with CO, it acts the exact opposite of NOx. So that's why it's difficult when you say, well, I want to reduce CO, I'm just going to increase the temperature. Easy enough. But by increasing the temperature, you're going to increase your NOx. Same thing with, I'm concerned about NOx, I'm going to operate at a lower temperature. Well, your CO has a huge spike. And so the reason why we pick that 1600 degrees Fahrenheit on standard flares is because it's a nice balance of CO and NOx formation. It, it, it is dependent, obviously, on some of the materials that we use as far as what we're making the stack out of. Um, but really, we pick that operating temperature because we're trying to maintain that balance between CO and NOx. So as you see, operating temperature goes up, NOx goes up, but CO goes down. Okay. So the red line that you see is going to be a typical CO formation with the dilution, the premixing. You know, how is CO formed? Not enough oxygen? Well, you've got your oxygen right there because you're forcing that premix. So you're able to have a nice flat line of CO regardless of temperature, okay. even at lower temperatures. This is how it's essentially staged up. You have your landfill gas line, which is for the most part unchanged. We will get into those mechanical components next. And then the blue line was the additional line for this particular process. So you have an air blower. Uh, it's bringing in outside air. You've got a filter on it to make sure you're not bringing in dirt and debris. It goes through. It, it, has, it goes through in a mixing chamber. So the landfill gas and the air doesn't mix until right here. And then it goes into the flare system and it gets ignited. We take a flow meter reading on the landfill gas. We also need to know how much methane we have in our gas stream because that's going to tell us how much stoichiometric air we need for combustion. We don't want that much air. We don't want stoichiometric. But we want enough excess so that we have that nice premix. So it is a constant PNID loop. If the landfill gas quantity decreases, we read it on the flow meter, we decrease the air blower. So the air blower is operated off of VFD, it can change its speed. If the landfill gas goes up, we register it. We know that we have 50% methane in this particular instance, then we're going to increase the air blower. Okay. And I'll talk to you about PID loops when we get to the electrical portion. This kind of shows you the pictures. This is the landfill gas line going in. That green thing is a flame arrestor. I'll tell you about that in a little bit as well. Your air line is a 54 inch duct. This is your mixing chamber and it goes into your flare. You can see in the back, uh, the top left corner, that's your air blower with a silencer. These air blowers for a 6,000 SCFM flare is going to be the size of nearly half this room. Very big air blowers, very large. And there's just another picture uh, showing the air blower and the air line. On the inside, these are, so methane is a pretty light hydrocarbon. Landfill gas is only half methane and half CO2. So it's half hydrocarbon, half fire extinguisher. Okay? We're diluting it even more. This is a lazy flame, so we need to make sure that we contain it. So we have these cans that we use, which is what you're looking at. 
most of the combustion and the flame is, is, is riding really low and it's taking place in that can. Because of that, we want to make sure that we still have that cross lighting. So in the standard flares, you've got a pretty big stable flame and those burners can cross light off each other. We we're a little concerned with this application because again, we're, we're diluting it. So it's going to be a lot cooler and it may not be able to light off as easily. So we've put these um, flame rods in between each of the burners. Uh, and this is just to kind of help with some of that pre-lighting so the flames can travel in between. Because we're dealing with a very low velocity application, we have the bigger potential for flashback. You aren't too concerned about flashback, not that you're not concerned, but in refinery applications, you're having such a velocity, high velocity, that that flame is shooting straight up. The risk of it going back down in the pipe is pretty minimal. For landfill applications, it's, it's far greater, okay? That flame can creep down and go back in the pipe. What we want to do again for this application is we want to put thermocouples on each one of those burners. And we want to, if we have any type of heat up that's happening, we shut the flare system down. So it's an extra safety precaution. Any questions on the low emissions flare before we move on? Okay. Any, yeah? Have any flashback if the premix is not flammable? Well, so you've, you've lit it off, okay? So you have oxygen, you have, you have landfill gas, and then you have air mixed together, okay? You light it off, and then now it is somewhat, it is flammable. Mm -hmm. Now, the rest of the pipe isn't, isn't flammable, so it's not going to flash back, but it can start to creep down and bring in more air. So it starts bringing in air, and then you've got the rest of what's in the pipe that is landfill gas and air, and so it can become combustible. And again, it's just that velocity that it just starts pulling it down. It'll burn down. It, it's a little different than a true full-blown flashback. Thank you. Sure. Um, what would a flashback look like on that particular application? Um, we, you know, a pretty minor flashback we've, we've seen to where the air blower, um, the, the filter was blown off 100 feet. And we were just, we were just operating the pilot. So that kind of gives you an idea of how, how serious flashbacks can get. For the hybrid thermal oxidizer, so we're going to get into beneficial use. So these are people coming in, they're wanting the landfill gas, they're going to use it for electricity, some type of, of fuel generation. If they're using it to strip off the CO2 and pretty much be left with natural gas, methane and natural gas is pretty much the same thing. So you can have like pipeline quality gas. Right now natural gas is pretty cheap, so you don't see a lot of these projects going on. When natural gas increases, you'll probably see a lot more landfill gas being used for pipeline quality. There's a series of membrane separation, um, you know, pressure swing absorption systems that take the CO2 off of the methane. What's left is a tail gas that we call. It's still got a little bit of methane in it, but not enough to burn on its own. So this is how we came up with this hybrid thermal oxidizer. We wanted to kind of use thermal oxidizer technology, but with the standard landfill technology because it was more cost effective. So what you're looking at on the left side is a CO2 removal system. What you're looking in the middle is our standard uh, hybrid thermal oxidizer. You'll see the injection ports. So what we do first is we have a core burner that's taking the landfill gas or biogas, whatever it is, just straight. It can either take that or it can take the treated uh, pure natural gas, it doesn't matter. We preheat it, okay, make sure we get to operating temperature, and then we inject the high CO2 stream um, inside around the flare at, at different injection points. Again, CO2 is a fire extinguisher. So we've got to make sure that how we inject it is in small quantities and it's nice and spread apart and it isn't quenching our flame. So this kind of shows a little bit more of the diagram. So we've got our fuel line. Typically this is just a four, six inch line. They want to use the least amount of fuel as possible. They're trying to sell the fuel. 
So the more, the, the key to these designs is minimalist syscas. You want to use as, as little as possible to make sure that you can still burn that CO2, okay? Because again, they're trying to sell it. So we've got our fuel line. It has a temperature control valve. It only uses the fuel that it needs to maintain a certain temperature. We need that certain temperature so we can get rid of the CO2. CO2, okay? So we also use uh, combat castable refractory instead of the blanket. So at the bottom portion of this flare, we have the castable brick refractory to kind of radiate heat. We create this to about 14, 1500 degrees before we ever start injecting the CO2. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to the mechanical components. I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, just to kind of let you know what's involved in designing these systems. Um, I mean, this is a combustion course, and what we do is definitely combustion in this industry. But because of, of our because of our industry, and we've got to actually get extract the gas from the landfill, we have a series of mechanical components that we have to use. So that's what makes us a little bit different than like a refinery application, um, where it really is just about combustion. It's just about that flare system. So here is a picture of a typical landfill. So again, we've already talked about the enclosed flare and everything else that you see over to the left is what we're gonna get into right now. This is an open flare. Uh, this particular flare is um, hydraulic, so you can unbolt it and do a lever and the flare system will actually lower into place. So this is really nice because, you know, on the open flares, what are you using to sense that you, your flare is on? Do you guys remember? What's detecting that you have a flame? Thermocouple. Thermocouple, right. Thermocouples are like light bulbs. Some last a week, some last two years. And we need to change one out, either gonna ha you're probably gonna have to rid a man lift, not with this hydraulic system. You can lower it, you've got a working platform, and you can change out the thermocouples. If your thermocouples are bad, you can't run your flare because you can't prove that you've got main flame. You have to prove you have main flame for compliance. So it's not just something that's, you know, that the site wants, the EPA. You have to report to the EPA that you have main flame. Okay. So the first thing, uh, critical safety devices, number one is the flame arrester. And the flame arrester is there to, if we have a flashback, it basically breaks the flame up into tiny little pieces and just kind of snuffs it out. So what you're seeing here is the internals of the flame arrester. It's very tight, crimped metal. Okay. It can be aluminum or stainless steel internals. It depends on your gas composition. We talked Tuesday about having H2S, hydrogen sulfide. It'll eat aluminum up, so we need to switch to stainless steel. If the piping, hold on one second, if the piping is in a horizontal line, we're going to want to make sure it's eccentric, which is flat on the bottom, so that it doesn't have water collection. If it's in vertical pipe, then it can be concentric. Yeah. I was going to ask, how big are like those crimps actually, like in the flame rest? Good question, and I should have brought. <laughs> I have little samples because they're. I can't bring a real one in. They're very heavy. Um, so this is all very dependent on the type of hydrocarbon you have. Okay? Methane is pretty mild. It's pretty low-key hydrocarbon. Hydrogen is not. You could look at hydrogen and cause it to burn. Hydrogen is flammable between like 2 and 98 percent air. So depending on what you're dealing with is going to be dependent on how, how hard it is going to stop it. So methane is pretty easy to stop. So its crimps might be like that. You can see through them. Hydrogen, and this all goes into what group. So these flame arresters are um, designed and tested for groups of gases. Methane is a group D gas. Hydrogen is a group B gas. A group B gas would be that. Can't see through it. So if you were designing a system and you had to deal with this, a lot of pressure drop cons considerably. So that's something else that you've got to think about. Um, flame arresters are also, which I'll show you on the next slide. 
So think of a fireball, tumbleweeds, a snowball. The longer it goes, the bigger, the more violent, and the harder it is to stop. It's the exact same thing when you have a flashback. You want that flame arrestor as close to your ignition point as possible. That's why it's at the inlet of the flare. If you put that flame arrestor 20 feet down the pipe, it's, not, it's like not even having one. It's not going to do a darn thing. It's going to blow right through it. So you can see that as you go down the pipe, exponentially it goes up to 5,000 miles per hour. Not only does it go to 5,000 miles per hour, it goes to 3,000 pounds. So it's very critical when you have a flashback that you stop it as soon as possible. Otherwise, if you didn't, when you got to the landfill, you'd be dealing with 5,000 miles per hour and 3,000 pounds. It can do a lot of damage. This what looks like inside. So you've got a flashback, all that crimping. All that crimping is doing is just breaking it up. It's cooling. It's taking, you know, remember methane has an auto ignition of what, 900 degrees. So it's essentially just cooling that down, snuffing it out so that you get below that auto ignition temperature. Okay, so this is an open flare. That's its inlet. What's missing? Where's the flame arrestor? Anyway, can you find it in the picture? Is it charcoal? Look at the pipe. Does the pipe look okay? But it's still standing, right? So the flame arrestor did its job. But why, why do you think the flame arrestor just took a beating and melted and then fell to the ground? It wasn't, but... So remember how we talked about open flares? We don't want to use a scanner for flame detection because it would pick up the sun, right? But in closed flares, we use a scanner. So if you have a flashback, where is the flame not located? Where it's supposed to be. Right. <laughs> it's not in the flare anymore. It's, it's, it's taking a left at Albuquerque. So with a scanner, if the flare, the flame, is not inside the flare, the scanner knows of it immediately. Okay? And it shuts off the gas source. On an open flare, we have thermocouples. It takes time for that thermocouple to cool off. So all the while, you know, let's say we say it's 200 degrees. That's usually a set point. Flames 1,000 degrees, we have flashback. The thermocouple has to cool from 1,000 degrees to 200 degrees before it shuts the system down. So whatever time that happens between cooling that 800 degrees, you are just sending gas to that fire. And that's exactly what happened here. It just kept sending gas until finally the thermocouple said, oh, I don't have a flame anymore, and it shut the gas source off. So the way that you would deal with this is you put another thermocouple at the inlet of the flame arrestor for 200 degrees, and it doesn't take long for them to heat up. It takes a while for them to cool off. But the second it senses 200 degrees, which means it's a flashback, then it shuts the gas source off. So that's just an additional protection that we would want to have for open flares. This one didn't have it. So when I say shut the gas off, this is the guy that shuts the gas off. It is a fail-closed valve, which is unique in biogas industry. When you have a refinery, you have an upset condition, you got to get that gas out of there. Their valves, if they use any, are fail open. They do not want that pressurized, violent gas trapped in. Our industry is completely different. Okay? We don't, we have a huge, big hole in the ground that can hold this gas for as long as it needs. It may start to smell after a while, but you got a big, nice storage area. What we don't want is venting raw gas. That's going to get the EPA on you faster than anything. So if we have a power outage, we want to make sure that the valve slams shut. So we actually use either air or electricity to keep the valve open. So we're constantly telling the valve to open. If you yanked off its power source, it would close. Okay. 
So that's what we mean by fail closed valve versus a fail open valve. You want to make sure that it is a very tight seal off. This isn't like a manual butterfly valve that you're just using it for tweaking. We need to make sure we have a tight seal. So that's when, as engineers, you're going to look at different types of material, whether it's Teflon, uh, Buna, nitrile. There's all different rubbers out there that are rated for different gas compositions, different pressures, all that types of good stuff. You want it pliable enough that it's a nice seal. And you want to make sure, so we've got a level positioner here just for safety, so we can check if it's open or closed. Okay. Flow meter is required by the EPA. So the EPA wants to know, was your flare on? And what's the flow? Because when you submit a permit to the EPA, you're telling them, I'm putting in this flare. It can operate at a maximum of this flow rate. This is its operating temperature. They care about operating temperature because that basically tells them that you're destroying the NOx and the CO and the destruction efficiency. So you have to continually prove 365 days a year that you are in compliant, that you are within operating temperature, you're within your um, operating flow rate, and that you were on. So you do this with a flow meter. We also use the flow meter to select thermocouples on the enclosed flare that talk to the dampers for temperature control. They're all different types of flow meters. You guys probably deal with differential pressure transmitters mostly uh, when you guys are in class. Those don't have the best turndown. Um, if you have a flare system that is rated for a 10 to 1 turndown, and that flow meter is trying to make sure that you've selected the right thermocouple, that flow meter has to match the same turndown as the flare system. So we needed to pick one and we do a thermal mass meter. All it is is measuring the difference. So you have a probe that's going into the stack and the gas goes across it and it cools it and that difference in temperature will equate to a flow. When you design these a lot of times different flow meters will require a certain pipe diameter undisturbed so that you kind of have that laminar. It's not turbulent, so it gets a good reading. So the flow meter is going to let you know how many pipe diameters upstream and downstream you need of no elbows, no valves, no nothing. So a complete undisturbed piece of pipe. Moisture separator. So we have our landfill. We dig wells in the ground. We connect them. We have main header. The main header is coming out of the ground. That's what you see right here. And the moisture separator is the very first thing that we connect to. So we want to try to get as much moisture as we can. Landfill gas is saturated. It's got water all around it. Blowers, metal, untreated cast iron, untreated, you know, it doesn't like moisture. So we try to knock out just the fine droplets before it goes to our rotating equipment to prevent corrosion. Gas blowers, so they have to pull a vacuum off the landfill, so they grab the gas off the landfill, that's the negative pressure, and then they have to have another positive pressure on the outlet of the blower to get to the end device, whether that be a gas facility or a flare, that distance. Whoever designs the landfill, who designs how many wells it has, how deep are the wells, um, how far distance they are, um, what diameter they are, they're going to be able to tell us how much vacuum we need. They're going to say, I need 100 inches to pull all this gas off this hill. So that information is given to us. We know, because we design everything from the blower to the end device, what type of pressure we need and losses for that. If you were to have um, a gas facility and you were a landfill owner, it's always best to be in charge of your own landfill, okay? So you want to extract all the gas off the landfill and you want to send the gas to the third party. You don't want to allow them to pull off your landfill. You start getting in a little bit of a, a fight and we'll talk about that in a second. So selection criteria, what we need to know when we design our blowers. Inlet and outlet pressure. Most of the time the outlet pressure is just 10 to 15 inches of water column. It's very small. We don't have a lot of pressure drop in our flare system. Uh, the enclosed flare, the burners, 
when they're clean, maybe an inch drop. Dirty might be five inches of water column. If we're going to a third party gas user, we need to know how far away they are and you might add an additional 10 inches of water column to that. We need to know the gas flow, methane percentage, side elevation, that's gonna change the gas density, that's gonna affect how the blower uh, is basically making this pressure. And then the blowers that we use, um, and I'll show you a picture in just a second, typically only have a turndown of about three to one. So you're going to have to use multiple blowers to try to achieve your maximum flow rate. So for example, you know, we taught, we kind of showed this curve here the other day about, um, so we've got years and we've got flow and here, but we need to design for here. So this, let's say is a thousand SCFM and this is 10,000. So, our flare system, we want to look at our flare system first. So 10,000 SCFM, if you go back and you look at your sizing chart, probably want to make this just even and nice. We would do two flares at 5,000 SCFM each. Okay. Okay, my blowers. So, if blowers have a three to one turndown, if I put a blower in for 5,000 SCFM, is it gonna get me to 1,000 SCFM? No. So then now I'm looking at doing blowers at 2,500. Okay? So that's when I say 50% flow that's what I'm talking about is I'm trying to reduce the blowers are going to be smaller than the flare system to try to achieve that bottom turn down does that make sense so in this case I would have four 2500 blowers this gets me the 10,000 SCFM maximum and it gets me the 1000 SCFM minimum For rotating equipment, chances are the blowers are usually is what needs the most work. They are not something that you can operate in place. They typically have to be shipped off. So if I were designing this, I would do five. So I would have an extra installed standby. So this is what the typical blowers we use. They're multi-stage, they're centrifugal machines. There's all different types of blowers. You've got sliding vane, you've got PD, all different selection of blowers, and it's all dependent on turndown and pressures that you want to achieve. For us, because we are relatively low flow, believe it or not, and low pressure, these are a really good selection for us. These are impellers. The more impellers you have is typically the more pressure it's going to build. The blower doesn't necessarily care what's going on in the inlet and the outlet. The blower just says, okay, you need 100 inches vacuum and 20 inches outlet. That just means 120 inches of pressure to me. So I need to produce 120 inches of pressure. Every time it goes through one of those impellers, it produces pressure. The impellers come in all different designs, different veins. You'll have backwards curve, frontward curve, and then the number of impellers. So typically the greater pressure that you're trying to achieve, you're going to have more stages. Okay. Valves and piping. Most of the time we can get away with plastic pipe, HDPE, that's high density polyethylene. It is really easy to weld and fuse, you essentially, it's plastic, you essentially melt it, stick it together, and it cools off. It's great in the field if you wanted to add a pressure gauge, you can just drill it. You don't have to have a welder, most of the people can work on it. Um, you can use HDPE up to temperatures to 160 degrees. So as long as you're underneath 160 degrees, you're good to use HDPE. 
If you have a really high pressure application, even though typical landfill gas is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, if you're producing a lot of pressure, there's a heat of compression. Just because it's going in that blower at 100 degrees, it very well could exit at 200 degrees. In that case, obviously we need to go to stainless steel. We don't use carbon steel because our landfill gas is corrosive. So we either use HDPE plastic or stainless steel. Also, we typically design for an internal velocity of about 80 to 90 feet per second for our piping. And that's internal diameter. Plastic pipe, 24 inch plastic pipe is two inches thick. Stainless steel is really thin. So if I'm thinking internal diameter, 24 inch HDPE is the equivalent of 20 inch stainless steel. So at some point it might actually be cheaper to do stainless steel than plastic, depending on the size. Expansion joints. Expansion joints are flanged on each side. They are rubber and they're essentially there to be attached to any type of rotating equipment that's going to vibrate. So you're going to see them in the picture. Um, they look like black. Mm, they're right, let's see, right there. Okay. You want to be on the inlet and outlet of each blower or anything that's causing vibrations. You don't want to put a rigid piece of pipe next to a big cast iron machine. Butterfly valves are used for isolation. So if you have a blower that's not in service, you want to make sure those valves are closed so you don't have gas going through it. And then check valves. Check valves are used to, they're wafer type check valves. So they look like this. When you've got flow, they close, let the flow pass. When you have flow going the other way, they're closed off. So it prevents backflow. So you don't have flow coming from one blower going in the outlet of the other blower. They are, uh, these little aluminum pipe spools that you see here. Okay. So future expansion, this is kind of what we're talking about a little bit with this, okay? So just because we only have flare systems that go up to 6,000 SCFM, someone logical might say, well, just buy a 6,000 SCFM flare today, and then when you need it, buy another one, and buy another one, and buy another one. So it's just kind of you know, duplicate systems all lined up. Couple problems with that. You then have multiple sources pulling off the hill, okay? It's also not, you know, plot effective. if You're using up a lot of real estate. And you've got, if each system is individual, you've got individual brains that aren't talking to each other, which is what I call the control panel. Also, it's not cost effective. So, for this system, this is in California, it was a 15,000 SCFM, that was their future flow rate. So in its main build out, this is what we designed for. Each one of these moisture separators is uh, 7,500 SCFM. We could have done a 15,000 SCFM moisture separator, but the bolts on the top of that thing to unbolt and do maintenance, it would have been a nightmare. Uh, these already have 64 bolts. So for operation perspective and maintenance, that's why we chose to do two moisture separators. So you see the two, the main header comes below the ground, splits off into two, goes into the two moisture separators, goes into the main header piping, okay? Main header piping, stainless steel, 24 inch. You also notice that what goes down into the blowers is smaller piping. It's because you don't need it. The blowers are reduced for lower flow. You don't need 24 inch piping. Again, you're trying to size for an overall 80, 90 feet per second. So the stub ends that are down on the blowers are 12 inch. The blowers are 5,000 SCFM each. This gives me three that will be operating at one time for that 15,000 SCFM and one that's, operate, that's one that's installed for a future spare. You also notice that the fourth one is missing. So why, why do you think we would not ship the last one? The last thing you want is rotating equipment out in the field that's not rotating. If you don't need it, you don't want to put it in there. So this system was really right about here. It was about 5,000 SCFM. So we can, we can have the overall system designed for a bigger flow, but only put the equipment that we need for that particular time. 
So when we shipped this system, it had three blowers and it just had one flare. Okay. When they need it, when they get to that point in the hill, they'll add the additional flare and they'll add the additional blowers. It's got one control panel, so it's got one, one set of brains controlling everything. You've got one source that's pulling off the landfill, and this is sending it to a gas plant. It was actually sent it to multiple gas plants. So just this one piece of equipment, which is 12 foot by probably 35 foot long, is controlling all the gas off one of the largest landfills in Los Angeles, sending it to three flares and sending it to a gas plant. This particular system is in Argentina. This was a 9,000 SCFM skid to 4,500 SCFM flares. So if you want to look at your first drawing, this is a very similar, it's a different flow rate, but it's very similar to the picture of the one in California that I just showed you. It's got one moisture separator. Um, you can see the overall dimensions. You can see that the control panel is installed on the skid. So blower skids, that's something that we do as a benefit to the customer. All this equipment can ship loose and be mounted in the field. The nice thing about having it all put on a skid is that we do that. Um, it's very cost effective to the person that's buying it. And we put the control panel on the skid so we can do all the wiring for them. So all the motor starters are wired to the blowers. If you've got any valves on the skid, they've got power to them, they're wired to it. Uh, flow meters, pressure transmitters, all that's already wired to the panel. All right, moving on to electrical stuff. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Um, so our centrifugal blowers rotate at 3,600 RPMs. You turn them on, 3,600 RPMs, whether you need them or not. If we need to slow them down because we need a different performance, you have to put in a variable frequency drive. So a lot of times you'll choose to put those in because that way you're only operating at the speed that you need. Um, you guys can look up the fan law. It's a one, two, three fan law. Um, essentially, basically says the speed's proportional to the flow, then you've got pressure, and then you've got horsepower. So horsepower is a cubed function. So if you're at half the flow, you're at significantly a reduced horsepower. So it can save a lot in electrical savings. VFDs, even though they're a lot more expensive than a motor starter, will typically pay back in about 10 years. Not only that, the beauty of these things is imagine So going back to that landfill picture, so bird's eye view, actually we'll do it this way. So you have all these wells in the landfill. You might have hundreds and hundreds of these things. And they all have individual controls on them that's controlling the amount that they're pulling off this section. So this guy being a perimeter well, again, we don't want to pull too hard because we don't want to pull in outside air. That's how you get oxygen. That's how you get a combustible situation. Some of these deeper ones, you know, you're going to want to adjust a little bit more. So each one of these wells have adjustability to maintain a certain distance, radius of influence with what they've got going on. With a VFD, what's really nice to not upset the situation is you can tell a VFD, I want to pull off 60 inches of vacuum. And it will ramp up and down to maintain a certain vacuum on that well field. If you didn't have a VFD, it's going to pull at a constant rate, and these are going to need to be adjusted more frequently. So the person that's in the field adjusting all these wells would be doing that all day long. So it's, it's nice to have something that says, I know that I need a certain amount of vacuum to pull all the gas off, not pull too hard, and to avoid odors. And I just set it up. So typically, it's a great you know, great option to have. Um, not only that, but again, if you are at the beginning stages of your landfill and you have a lot less flow, you can dial them down. You don't worry about it. You just tell them what vacuum to pull. Control panels. Um, we get 
this industry gets a little bit more expansive on the controls. Again, a refinery industry just needs to flare that stuff off. They need to know the pilot's always on and they just get rid of it. So there's, there's not a lot of controls to it. For us, we're doing lots of different things with the gas. We've got to send it different places and it's got to have hierarchy. Um, we also need things for compliance. Chart recorder, uh, you got to have it for EPA monitoring. We've got to prove that we're at temperatures, flows, we've got to prove we're on, all that good stuff. Um, you've got a touch screen. These can range in size and color and all sorts of stuff. But everything that the user needs to control goes through the touch screen. They don't ever touch the PLC. You don't want them touching the PLC. That's where you do all your programming. You as design engineers will touch the PLC, but you don't want your customers. You want your customers to be able to turn it on and off, uh, to select different functions. It's basically like touching the TV versus getting inside the TV. And then what does it look like inside the TV? Well, it depends on what you're running. Um, if you have a lot of analog inputs and outputs, you're bringing in a lot of transmitters, flow meters, control valves, you're going to need a larger PLC. And these are things that we design. So it's not like we're dealing with a separate electrical engineer. This is stuff that as we're designing these systems, we have to take into account what type of PLC that we'll use. And if you guys are familiar with PLCs, even, I mean, you don't have to program or anything, but if you kind of know how they work, is it's a big advantage. I mean, in this world, a lot of what you're going to be dealing with is going to have a PLC. So the familiarity with them is going to be very, very good for you. Uh, there's all sorts of different alarms that you might want to add um, for blowers. If a blower is corroded, it's going to start to vibrate or it's going to start to heat up. And if you don't pay any attention to it, it's going to have a catastrophic failure. So you could put vibration sensors on it to alarm you if they get out of spec. You can put bearing thermocouples, so if your bearings are heating up, you can shut the system down. You can make sure that you get that grease in the oil and get it lubricated. So there's a lot of things, alarms, notifications that you can put in the system that will save from having a failure and a total replacement for a blower. Okay. Any questions on that stuff before we get into gas plants and P&IDs? Okay. Are you surprised how much mechanical stuff this has, as opposed to the other? No? Yes? Okay. I'm gearing you up for flare gas recovery. They don't even have a flare. There's no combustion. That's next week. All right, beneficial use. So that changes all the time. You can go on the EPA. LMOP is the Landfill Methane Outreach Program. <laughs> Sounds like a help center for landfills. But that is what keeps track of all the beneficial use that all the landfills are, are going along. So it's kind of, we got, gosh, this was probably a few months ago, but landfills are generating 2,237 megawatts of electricity. No. The largest active landfill right now, guess where it's located? It's not Los Angeles. New York City doesn't even have any landfills, they have no space. But Staten Island, that's a real big landfill. Pretty much the whole island. No, come on, what city? What city is just growing, growing, growing? Houston, Chicago, Phoenix, Nope. Nashville. Nope. Big city, big lights, gambling. Las Vegas. Oh, yay, all right, yes, Las Vegas. So the largest active landfill in the U.S. is in Las Vegas. It's scheduled to be open for 300 years. And there is a poor person's job that every year he has to do budget modeling for 300 years. He calls me and asks questions. Um, so yes, and they uh, obviously have a gas plant and they are hooked directly up to Nevada Power. They deposit it right back into the grid and sell it. All right, so gas utilization. This is where we get into the fun playing with each other and legal terms and conditions and all sorts of stuff. So the landfill owner owns the landfill. 
the EPA comes after the landfill owner, not the gas plant. If I'm the landfill owner, I want to have total control over my landfill because if something happens with it, I'm the one that gets blamed. So you have the gas developer that contractually is completely on the other side of the fence. There literally is going to be a line that you can't see as a contractual point of I'm on landfill property, I'm on gas plant property. Okay? There is a contractual document that says landfill owner, you're going to deliver said gas to this point at this temperature, at this pressure, and it's going to have this much methane. And to be okay with my contract, you have to do this a certain amount of time. And if you don't, then I can fine you and sue you and all sorts of stuff. Okay? And this is regardless of what you're using the plant gas or the landfill gas for. Engines, turbines, doesn't matter. There is a contractual line that separates the landfill gas owner's responsibility and the gas developer. We talked about that. So, if I am a gas plant, I am going to try to talk the landfill owner into letting me pull off their hill because I don't want to wait for it. I want to get my gas when I want my gas. I want to pull off your landfill. As a landfill owner, if I'm not smart, I'll say, sure, go ahead. But what do you think? Okay, so kind of skipping ahead a little bit. If I'm generating electricity, those are pretty big blowers, don't you think? I mean, we're probably not dealing with inches of water column, right? So if I've got a gas plant that's generating pounds and pounds of pressure, those are some big blowers. Then I've got my little landfill owner's blowers. If they're both pulling off the hill, who's going to win? The big blowers. So now the landfill owner doesn't even really have a lot of control over what gas he can get. And that is really going to wreak havoc on this thing. So it's always best to have one vacuum source and then you draw that line in the sand literally and say, gas plant, I'm going to give you said gas at these specs. Obviously, the gas plant's paying you, the flare's not. So you want to send all the gas you can to the gas plant, the flare now becomes a backup device. Okay. Gas plants, uh, if it's engines, internal combustion engines, um, those are pretty sensitive. They go on and off all the time. If one of those goes off, you immediately have all that gas that needs to go to the flare. So the flare can see a variety of flow rates constantly. So we start putting our process engineering hat on and making sure that now our end device that used to get all this flow constantly is now going to get varying flow. We need to make sure that we're diverting it correctly and the flare system can handle it. Here's the breakdown of current uh, beneficial use projects and what they go to. Obviously, the big blue chunk is IC engines, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, boilers, I think I talked about um, uh, beer so uh, and Captain Morgan and all these other stuff that generates biogas. And um, uh, the Modelo Brewery in Mexico, they have, that's, that's their beneficial use project. They use the land, or it's by digester gas, but they use that and their boilers to generate steam for their brewery. So that would be that beneficial use. Um, turbines, micro turbines, combined cycle, which is you know different power plant. Um, but for the most part, big chunk of it is just internal combustion engines. So of all the projects, so you've got pipeline quality, you've got industrial steam, and then you have electricity. So you can put in turbines to generate electricity. You can put in engines to generate electricity. All of the electricity projects, 76% of them are with IC engines. Um, they're, they're pretty easy. They're cost effective. You need five pounds of pressure. They're usually sized about 500 SCFM a piece. Um, now, you do need some type of conditioning equipment, which I'm going to talk about siloxane in a second. So remember how I talked about you know, the discharge of the blowers? If I'm a landfill owner and I only need 10 inches of water column to my flare, but my gas plant needs five inches of water column, I'm probably going to tell them it's their responsibility. 
If you want five pounds, you need to bust it up to five pounds. I don't need five pounds for my flare. So they will get it to line in the sand, 10, 20 inches of water column, and then now it's the gas plant's responsibility to put in additional blowers that would bump it up to five pounds of pressure because they're the ones that need it. They own those blowers, they own that equipment. If there's anything else they need, um, any type of conditioning equipment, they put that in as well. These engines do not like moisture. So you'll put in a dehydration system, um, some air to gas exchangers where you're knocking, you're knocking the uh, gas temperature down to knock all the water out and then reheating a little bit. So there is additional conditioning equipment that's needed before you put it in an IC engine. Okay, so we are gonna get into a little bit of gas plane interaction and then we'll get into siloxane systems and then we should be pretty close to being done. So PNIDs, um, we're gonna get into more complicated PNIDs in just a second, but I'm going to simplify this down. Um, so it's, it looks scary on paper, but they're really easy to read. Um, PNID, process instrumentation diagram. Uh, PCV, FCV on these drawings I'm gonna show you is pressure control valve, flow control valve. Most throughout the industry, somewhat of these are universal. Uh, different industries might change notations, but they're, they're pretty consistent. FE is your flow element, or flow meter in our case. Uh, SOV is your uh, shutoff valve, main fill closed valve. And then a PIC is your control loop, okay? The way you know that you have, now you have a PNID, but then you have a PID control loop. That's proportional integral derivative. That's your control loops, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, you know when you're looking at a PNID because you have a diamond and you have dash lines. Whatever those dash lines are going to is what's part of that control loop. Okay? And they tie them all together by the digits at the end. So, PIC is my control loop, 110 is my tag. It's going to control my pressure control valve 110. And my pressure control valve has got to be based on pressure. Where am I reading my pressure? From a pressure transmitter, PIT-110. It's that easy. Looks scary, but it's easy. So this is a very simple drawing done by myself. I'm not a drafting person. So we have gas coming from the landfill. Here's my landfill gas blower. Again, I want to operate off a constant vacuum. So my blower has a VFD. My VFD is connected to a pressure transmitter that's on the main header, and it constantly talks to each other. It says, I want to be at 60 inches of water column, and it will speed up the VFDs or slow down the VFDs to make sure that pressure transmitter is always reading 60 inches. After I leave the landfill gas blowers, I want to send my gas to the gas plant. The gas plant has its own blowers because it needs more pressure. Okay. I want to send as much gas to the gas plant as possible but I don't know what's going on at the gas plant. It's totally not my deal. I'm the landfill owner. I just need to know how much excess the flare wants to take. The flare is closer to these blowers. It's the path of least resistance. If you don't encourage the flow to go to the plant, the plant's not gonna get it. Okay? So we have a control valve that's in the flare line that's pinched off. So it creates the path of least resistance to the gas plant. Engines are sized for about 500 SCFM. They pop on and off it all the time. If this line, so let's say, here's the line in the sand right here. If I said I'm going to deliver you gas at zero inches of water column, that's what this pressure transmitter is going to read. Their compressor is going to take zero inches of water column and get it up to five or six pounds. If I have engines that start to go down, what's going to happen with this pressure transmitter? Is it going to read more or less? I've got stuff here that's not taking my gas. So I'm going to have stuff build up in the line. So this is no longer going to be zero inches of water column. It's going to jump up. When it jumps up, it's going to send a signal to this control valve going, I need you to open. I need you to take more gas, please. This opens and more gas goes to the flare. Engines come back online. This guy drops below zero. It says, Mr. 
control valve, I need you to close. I'm back online now. So you can do all that very easily with just a transmitter and a control valve without having to get all this feedback from the plant. I mean, we could sit there and get all the feedback from every engine, if it's on, if it's not, do an algorithm, figure it all out. This is a lot easier. And we're not having, you're, you're minimizing that interaction and those control um, communications between you and the plant. Does this make sense? Okay. Notice that my fill closed valve is not my pressure control valve. A lot of people will say, well, can't I just do that in one valve? You do not want to. You want this guy, it's a safety valve, you want it separated. Okay. So, what happens? So in this instance, let's say my flare shut down. I don't know why. Thermocouple blew out, who knows. My gas plant is the only entity that can take gas. My gas plant, let's say my landfill is sized for 10,000 SCFM, my gas plant can only take 5,000 SCFM. Do I want to remain on vacuum control, pulling all 10,000 SCFM if my plant can't take it? That's not going to do any good. So what happens is here, my flare's on, everything's great, my flare shuts off for some reason, I'm going to now take my VFDs and discharge control. So now my landfill blowers are only pulling the amount of gas off the landfill that's needed for the gas plant because it doesn't have anywhere else to go. It doesn't make sense to continue to pull all that gas off the landfill. You can't do anything with it. At any time my flare system goes back online, the system automatically goes to this. This is one of the, I think, the funner parts about our job is designing these things. Because not only are you dealing with combustion, you get to deal with rotating equipment, sizing piping, sizing valves, but you get to do a lot of this process logic. And this, it gets a lot more complicated, so just wait. So here is your touch screen. So remember PIC was your control loop? So look at the top. It's labeled PIC 100B. So it's telling me, when I go to this screen, it's telling me that this is the screen. Every control loop has its own screen. You've got your set point. So this would be 0 inches of water column, 60 inches of water column. You have your gain, you have your reset, and you have your rate. Gain is P, reset is I, rate is D, proportional integral derivative. Have you guys had any training on PID control loops? All right. Okay, so what does the gain do? Yes and no. Yep. What about the, what about the, um, what is the what does the reset do? Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, what about rate? It reduces the noise. You guys are close. Okay. Do you want me? I'll give you my version um, of of how I remember this. It's it's pretty easy. Okay. Um, so you are your cruise control. Okay. In your car because we can all relate to that. So you set your cruise control for 80 miles an hour. You are going 40 miles an hour. You obviously need to make a change. When you make a change, do you slam on the gas or do you just tap it with your pinky? That's your gain. When you make a change, how big is it? So not how often are you making the change, but it's living in the present. All it says is I'm not where I need to be, I need to make a change. That's your gain. Your reset is minutes per repeat. It's how often it's looking to see if it makes a change. So if you want to be going 80 miles an hour and you're cruising at 40 and you're only checking it out every three minutes and you're making a pinky of a change, it's going to be days before you get up to 80, or 80 miles an hour. So the higher that number is, the more often you're looking. So this is how often you're looking to see if you're at your set point. Also, it learns from itself. So if it looked and it made a huge jump, it kind of looks at the error. So, okay, I made a big jump, but I'm pretty close to my set point, and it'll start kind of adjusting itself. So think of reset as 
uh, the past. Okay? So game is living in the present. It doesn't know anything, but it needs to make a change. It makes a change. Okay? Your integral or your reset is a little bit of the past because it's learning from itself. It's how often I need to look to make a change, and then I'm adjusting. Your rate is your overshoot. So if I'm at 78 miles per hour, I'm probably not going to put the regular gain on because I'm just going to go now 95 miles an hour and I'm going to have to correct. So that is what your rate does, is it anticipates the future. So, was that easier? Can you remember that? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, and this is, if the gas plant's down, you can notice that I have no dash line. I just take that control loop off, okay? I drive PCV totally open. It's not modulating. I don't have an active control loop, and it's just going to the flare like the gas plant never existed. Okay, now we're going to get more complicated. Now we have two flares. So we have a gas plant, we have two flares. The easiest way to do this is to compartmentalize it. Okay, try not to... Uh, you know, take the elephant all in one bite, just little sections. So step one, all I want to do is get all the gas off the landfill. That's what I care about. So that's my first control loop. When you start integrating control loops within each other, you're going to get really complicated, and it's very difficult to tune. So try to think of them as chunks. So my first control loop is just trying to get the gas off the hill. That's all it cares about. My next control loop is I need to send as much gas to the plant. It's all I care about. I don't know what's going to get it. If it's flare one, flare two, or both, I just know I need to send it to the plant. And then whatever's left over, I'll send it somewhere else. So this part looks just like one flare. Okay? This loop didn't change at all. All this loop cares about is what the plant can and can't take. Now we've added an additional control because we have to figure out which flare it's going to go to. So now we have excess gas, we have two flares online, which one is it going to go to? In this instance, we have seven unique operating scenarios. These are seven individual things that could be going on and that could be transferred to each one another. For example, if you are operating in plant flare one and flare two, and you lose flare two, you're going to plant flare one automatically and you're going to have to design your control loops to compensate for that. The plant, you lose the plant, now you're in flare one only mode. Someone's not out there selecting all this. So you have to design a system that takes this all into account, that tries to get things back up and running, and that changes these control loops. So this is our version of, of process engineering, is figuring out the hierarchy and cause and effect. And you know this is really what we're doing, is, is cause and effect. Um, diagrams on this. So for this one, I have all entities taking gas. There's my first control loop, second control loop. So now I've got a third control loop. I've got to figure out which gas is going to go to which, which flare. I need to pick a flare that's primary. You have to decide one. So I'm going to make flare 100 primary, flare one. So I'm going, to have, I'm going to know that this flare is rated for, let's say, 5,000 SCFM. I don't want to give it any more than 5,000 SCFM. It's going to shut down on high temp. So maybe I want it to operate at 4,000 SCFM, and anything over 4,000 SCFM is going to go to my second flare. So again, I want to make sure that the primary flare is, is the path of least resistance. So this FCV157 this is not an active control loop. This control valve is not modulating, but it's driven to a fixed position so that it diverts the flow to this guy. This guy is going to open or close depending on whatever flow that I want to give flare one. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. If for some reason I decided I want to make flare two my primary, this guy would lose its control loop, it would be driven to a fixed position, and then this one would have a control loop. A lot of people may say, well, they're the same size flare and they're symmetrically installed, why do I need it? It's because, you know, it's, it's not perfect. And you definitely want, if something happened, 
you got something caught in this line and you didn't try to control it and you sent all the flow to one flare, you would shut down on high temp and then now you're down two devices. So what happened here is I went from all three entities getting gas to the gas plant shut down. So I lost that control loop. So now I have two out of the three working. This one, I went from all three entities getting gas to my flare two shutting off. Well, if I only have one flare, and I guess I should have told you this, maybe you guys are smart enough to figure out the red lines mean there's gas. Uh, I've lost flow to this guy, so I don't need these control loops. Whatever's left over is just going to get sent to the one flare that's working. And then that, I just lost the plant. So now I'm going to only one flare. We're getting towards the end, aren't we? Three minutes. My goodness. All right. Well, so siloxanes, we talked a little bit about that on Tuesday. Um, silica, oxygen, they corrode that white powder. Engines don't like them. We've got a pressure swing, temperature swing absorption system that has a media that absorbs the siloxanes on it. And we have a specialized flare that takes it. So this is pretty self-explanatory. I think you guys can kind of read through it a little bit. There's not any test questions on siloxanes, maybe just maybe what siloxane is. But I do want to show you, if you want to get out your drawings real quick, go to um, the last one, the more complicated one. Let's walk through this a little bit since this is a real PNID. Let me grab one that I can actually see. So I always read the PNIDs from the left to the right. So we we'll start over on the far left. It's going to tell you landfill gas, and it's going to tell you what's coming in. So where's my first diamond, and what is it controlling? Can someone tell me that? That's my first control loop. What is it? PIC. And what's it controlling? So that's, my vac so that's my vacuum control, exactly. It then goes in the moisture separator. Uh, it then goes into four blowers. So you can see there, blower 106, 105, 104, 103. Expansion joints on the inlet and outlet, that's EJ. Hand valves, butterfly valves on the inlet and outlet. After they leave that, they go to a flow meter. And then we see PCV 110. What's my next control loop? What's it going to? So PIC 110, all you got to do is find the other things that say 110. Follow the dash line. Control valve and then see PIT 110. What line is it in? Follow that line. Where does it say it's going? Gas facility. So that is my control valve. That pressure transmitter, PIT 110, is what's in the gas facilities line. Notice that diamond above it. Look up. See how it's also tied into the VFDs? That would be your discharge control. Okay, go back to the flare line. You then go into a SOV, which is your fill closed valve. You also see there that you have a tie down that goes into sheet two. That's going into another flare, a different sheet. But let's go back up to our flow meter, FE107. Follow that guy up. You see a diamond. Follow it over. You see that it's tied into the thermocouples at the top. Follow it down. It's tied into the dampers. There's your other control loop. Right. Any questions? So this looks really, I mean, if you guys were to, I mean, this looks pretty busy and frightening, right? It's, it's easy. Just follow the diamonds, follow the dash lines. Whenever you go to a job site, this is what you need. This tells you everything that's going on.
Any questions that come up, just email me. Thank you guys for letting me teach you. Enjoy your weekend.